Hi everyone, I'm delighted to be able to um, contribute to this great initiative. I've had a look at a few of the proposals, not all of them, but um, there's, <clears throat> there's quite a range and there obviously is a huge level of interest in this, which is, is wonderful. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to talk you through kind of design from a general perspective. It's not going to be specific to simulation. I'm not an expert on simulation. Um, my area of interest is kind of general medical education or general education. And I'm going to talk you through some kind of general design principles that apply to any kind of education that you're ever going to deliver. So <clears throat> we'll put a focus towards simulation and I'm hoping to have a practical element in this as well. So we're going to try using the whiteboard function within Zoom. Um, we'll have a go at it. If it doesn't work, we'll get around it another way. But we, we're, we were having a little practice run there and I think hopefully it will work. So um, without further ado, I'm going to move on and talk a little bit. Just sorry, move on here, see if this will, yeah. So um, I suppose what are learning outcomes? I see um, some names I rec recognize there from being recent medical students and you'll all be familiar with the term learning outcomes. I'm a bit of a dinosaur in this area. I qualified quite a long time ago and learning outcomes weren't really a thing when I was a medical student. Um, but really, I suppose learning outcomes have to do with putting a focus on the student in terms of learning. Um, and learning outcomes are what a student should be able to do at the end of your teaching initiative. So whatever that is, if it's a course, if it's a single session, if it's a whole program, you can write learning outcomes at different levels. So for you, you're going to be writing learning outcomes at the level of what students will be able to do, our participants will be able to do at the end of your simulation session. Um, it's important not to just think about the learning outcomes, but to think of them in a bigger context. Um, and this context is something that we call constructive alignment. And constructive alignment means that your learning outcomes um, what the student should be able to do has to align with what you teach and how you expect students to learn during your teaching session. Um, and it should be accessible. So in other words, you should be able to see or demonstrate that students have learned what you intended them to learn in the out at the outset. And that's all about design and it's a cycle. So when you write your learning outcomes, you should be thinking at the same time, right, what are they going to be doing during the simulation? Um, and how would somebody judging this simulation be able to know that students actually have learned what you wanted them to learn? And that's how these um, initiatives are going to be judged. They're going to look at your design, they're going to look at the session, and they're going to um, see, is there dem can you demonstrate that the learning outcomes have been met by the simulation session? So I suppose if you think about um, focusing on student learning, um, so this, there's a term student-centered learning, which I'm sure you're probably all fami familiar with. Um, and that puts the focus on what students should be able to do rather than what the teacher does or what the teacher wants to do. Um, and there's lots of kind of good reasons for it, but these are a couple of the key tenets. Um, students should be active, involved and participating for it to be considered student-centered learning. The teacher is there as a facilitator and a resource rather than somebody kind of throwing out their wisdom and knowledge at the students. They should be there more in a facilitator role, allowing the students to be involved and learning themselves. <clears throat> and the emphasis in stu on student-centered learning is that students will achieve deeper learning and understanding of whatever the area you're, you're focusing on. So simulation, if you think of it, is an ideal method for student-centered learning. This is a photograph taken in the Assert Centre um, in UCC a few years ago. So there may even be somebody uh, who you know in that photograph. And um, these were final year medical students doing a simulation. So you can see the level of student engagement. You can see there's no sign of a teacher in sight. Um, and you can see that students are obviously working with a mannequin with previous knowledge that they have to obviously do something. So um, I suppose the terms learning outcomes often get mixed up with learning objectives in particular. And I just thought it was worth quickly um, defining just or explaining what the various terms mean. So an aim is a broad purpose of a course of study 
So often it's at a course level, but it could be for your simulation session. So it might be, for example, in medical education to introduce students to the anatomy of the cardiovascular system. That would be a very broad, high level um, thing that you would want students, you, you want to achieve from your, your teaching. An objective is the teacher's purpose for designing a course. So what you want to achieve. So you want students to be familiar with the anatomical structure of the heart, say. Um, and both aims and objectives are written from the teacher's perspective. <clears throat> Learning outcomes are written from the perspective of the student. And I always think it's really useful at the beginning of your learning outcomes to actually physically write down the sentence, at the end of this session, students will be able to. In other words, um, that will set you up for writing the learning outcomes properly. Otherwise people start writing kind of waffly things, but that really focuses you. Because um, the next thing that you should be able to do is to, and you're gonna put in a verb and it's going to hopefully be an action verb. And we'll talk about appropriate verbs now in a moment. Sorry, not moving on just here, yeah. So my learning outcomes for this session is that at the end of this session, that participants, I should say, rather than students in this case, should be able to construct learning outcomes in the cognitive, psychomotor and affective domains. And we'll come back to those. So there's kind of three different areas that we look at in education. And these relate, the cognitive relates to knowledge, the psychomotor to skills and the affective domain to attitudes and behaviors. And it's good educational practice to consider all these in every education session. Some are more relevant in some sessions than others, but I think in simulation, all three are very relevant. And I would hope that um, you'd be able to make a case for constructive alignment and that you'll actually apply it in your applications when, when you are submitting your final applications. So I'm going to finish with the theory now in a minute. I just want, thought it was important though to frame and kind of give you the concepts of why you approach it this way. So teachers and students um, can approach teaching and learning from different directions. <clears throat> so as a student, and you've all been students much more recently than I have, but you, what you look at, if you're starting a new module, you're gonna look and think, how is this assessed? And then the next step is, okay, how do I make sure I'm ready for that assessment? What do I need to learn? The teacher looks at it differently. The teacher looks at it from the beginning and says, right, what do I want students to learn here? Um, so they start with um, learning outcomes and then think about teaching activities that they're going to design so that students learn what they want learned. And then they put the assessment at the end. But by constructively aligning something, you felt this kind of cycle. Um, and it doesn't matter which way you go around it. You can start with the assessment, go back to teaching and learning activities, and that the learning outcomes will flow from that, or vice versa. You can start as a teacher with the learning outcomes, move to the teaching and learning activities, move to the assessment. Um, <clears throat> and it allows a kind of a coherence between the student's view and the teacher's view. Um, I hope that makes sense to you. I'm very happy for questions or at any point now as well, just to say that. Um, I'm going to get you doing some practical things in a, in a minute or two, but I just want to give you a couple of other little bits and pieces that will be helpful for that practical element. So this is a table called Bloom's Taxonomy. You can Google them. Um, and I'll also share these slides afterwards because I think it's really useful to have this in front of you when you're looking at designing learning outcomes. So it's, it's a pyramid. Um, at the bottom, you've got the kind of lower level learning outcomes. So um, for example, remember and understand are considered to be lower level learning outcomes or learning areas. So what these, the kind of things that you cover with this is students should be able to define something or list something or repeat something or identify something. Um, or classify or describe. And as you move up Bloom's taxonomy, you're increasing the levels of complexity of what students are going to learn, okay? So as you move up, often we don't get quite up to this level. When you're designing learning outcomes, you need to think at the level of your students, where are they at? So you might, for a first year student, have a lot down at this level. And as students progress through their education, you might be introducing more higher level um, learning outcomes where they're applying knowledge that they already have to do something else. Um, for your simulation, I would imagine you're looking at um, probably learning outcomes roughly in this kind of area where they're applying prior knowledge 
to do something. You're not going to be learning from scratch, um, learning the basic principles of how to read an ECG or how to administer, uh, you know, work out the dose of a medication or something. That's prior knowledge that you're building on and applying in a simulation scenario. So these are the kind of verbs you might be thinking of using. Um, students might be, you know, demonstrating knowledge of something, interpreting an ECG, um, performing a particular task. So these are all the kind of things that you might be looking at for these students. So um, having said that, you shouldn't be focused always on high level learning outcomes. Sometimes it's important to put in um, lower level ones as well and to introduce a couple at the higher levels. So depending on the situation, but as I said, in your scenarios, you're going to be dealing, I think a lot with this, these kind of level learning outcomes, or even maybe up here that they might have to make a judgment on something or critique something or evaluate a patient's condition to decide what the next step is. Um, just thinking about these, the psychomotor, um, the cognitive and the effective domains in terms of writing learning outcomes. So in a cognitive domain, the kind of things you might be assessing from a simulation perspective would be kind of knowledge of guidelines or protocols. So, you know, do they know the kind of proper sequence of events in performing CPR or whatever? Um, you want to be, you'd be looking at recognition. Do they recognize abnormal ECG? Can they read it? Can they interpret it? Um, can they calculate a drug dosage, for example? So they're all things that would be in the cognitive domain. The psychomotor domain then requires things like measurement or, or to demonstrate that they can do a task. So for example, measurement of a blood pressure or using a machine or a, performing CPR, they'd all be things in the psychomotor domain. And then the effect of one, which can seem a little bit more difficult um, in terms of how you approach it, uh, how you approach assessment is a very important one still to consider because um, it has to do with attitudes and behaviors. So for example, you would want students to exhibit professional behavior. You'd want them to listen, um, demonstrate that they listen, that they can communicate well, that they can evaluate a situation. So they're more effective um, level learning outcomes. Okay, have there any questions at this particular point? Nothing coming through the no. chat yet. Okay, right. Okay, so what we're going to do now um, in a moment is we're going to get the whiteboards going, but I'm just going to give you one or two qu quick pointers in terms of do's and don'ts. And what we're going to get you to do is to write a learning outcome in the effective domain um, in a few minutes. Um, and you can think, you can do it in relation to anything, but you might find it most useful to do it in relation to your um, the scenario that you've, you've proposed. Um, if you have a pen and paper nearby, it may be useful having that in case the whiteboards don't work, but hopefully we'll find that the whiteboard does work. So we want you to, I think at the top, what we'd be saying is at the end of this session, the student will be able to. So I want you to use, consider using one action verb per learning outcome, and we only want you to write one. So it might be to, in a cognitive one, it, it might be something like to recognize the signs of heart failure, say or recognize an MI on an ECG or recognize atrial fibrillation. Um, so when you're doing th this, when you're writing your learning outcomes, you need to consider your action verb. You need to consider it in terms of, can this be assessed easily? We want you, to, uh, you would need to also consider the level of complexity. Is it too complex? Is it too basic for what the, the teaching and learning activity is? Um, we're going to go through each of the, these domains separately, but we're going to start with the cognitive. You should match your teaching and learning out activity to the learning outcome you write. So I'm going to ask you to write a learning outcome to think about a teaching and learning activity that you would conduct that will match to that learning outcome. And to think about how somebody looking at a recording of your scenario would be able to assess the students and say, yes, I can see that that student is now able to do X, Y, or Z, or isn't able to do X, Y, or Z that I planned in the learning outcome. Some of the don'ts about learning outcomes, and this first one here is actually the biggest mistake people use with learning when constructing a learning outcome is to use the 
verb understand. So at the end of this session, students will understand how to do CPR. Like that's not accessible. In, it's not clearly easily accessible. Because um, how do you assess understanding? Understanding is something of a difficult term to assess. So you want to think, what's the way I'm actually going to assess the understanding? So am I going to assess understanding by getting them to, to write down a list of things? Or am I going to assess understanding by observing their behavior, that it's professional, that they understand professional behavior is, is important and therefore you can see them behaving professionally? Or am I going to assess how they do CPR? or how they follow a, a protocol. So think about what you're going to actually assess and think about the verb there in terms of relating it to the assessment, okay? Um, don't forget your students' current level of knowledge and skills. Make sure you're pitching your learning outcomes at the right level. You could, wouldn't expect first year students to be able to do something that you expect a final year student to do. And one of the other biggest mistakes when people are designing learning outcomes and thinking about a session is that very often we try to do too much. And I don't know about you, but I find it very demotivating to be in a teacher or have done in the past when I was a student to be at a session where there's just too much stuff thrown at you or you're expected to do too much and you come out more confused and feeling poor self-efficacy at the end. Better to do less and actually have students feeling like they've achieved it at the end. So just always be aware, am I trying to do too much or too little? Where is kind of the right level? And that's something that's hard to gauge sometimes in the beginning, but comes with experience. But, you know, just be aware of that and maybe ask other people to look it over and think, am I trying to do too much here? So for example, a simulation scenario, I think if it's a brief simulation and a once once off piece, you might be looking at one to two learning outcomes in each of the domains. So you might be looking at somewhere between four, five learning outcomes for the whole thing, max. I don't think you should be going beyond that. You might have one um, effective, maybe one or two psychomotor and maybe one or two in the um, cognitive domain. And three might be plenty, depending on the scenario. So now John is going to share the whiteboard with you. Um, to get access to the whiteboard, um, you'll see, at least on my screen, it's at the top of the screen, there was um, view options. And when I clicked on that and looked down the list, there's an annotate is one of the options. If you click on that, it puts up um, a tab across the top with a number of options in it. If you click on the one with the T for text, that allows you to write on the screen, to type on the screen. OK, um, at the time you're typing, your name comes up. But after that, it's anonymous. We don't know who wrote what. And John will move them around the screen if they're all land landing on top of each other. So maybe think about starting down in a corner somewhere away from the top left hand corner um, so you're not on top of each other. But I'd like each of you to think about your scenario. And we give you a couple of minutes to, to write a learning outcome. I'm not going to pick on anyone, but we'll just have a look through them and kind of comment and think, well, how might you assess that? Um, so it's the other things you, I want you to be thinking about are um, so right what the students will be able to do at the end of the session, how you're going to teach it and how you're it would be accessible. So um, with that, John, I might ask you to to um, there are the three questions to just share the whiteboard. Unfortunately, this screen won't be available to you, um, but if you're struggling, let me know and we can we'll help you through it. Okay. So I hope this piece will be interactive. You can turn off your mics if you need to happily we'll answer questions. Okay, so yeah, we can see certainly there's somebody able to access it anyway. Um, so yeah, this is a good opportunity just to put in the learning objectives you've maybe already outlined in your submission to date and just have maybe Catherine look through how these could be made a little bit clearer, a little bit more focused. Yeah, so I'm not going to be able to deal with everyone's, but we could, you know, put in something in there that, um, and we can we can look at it then. So, So I'm seeing administer EpiPen there, and that's more a psychomotor one. So I want you at the moment to think about um, 
think about the uh, the cognitive domain. Think about things more more cognitive, more knowledge based, rather than something that they physically do. Okay. Yeah. So the first one I'm seeing there is differentiate acute um, acute stroke patients likely to benefit from thrombectomy. So that is very much a cognitive one. So administering an EpiPen will be a great one to bring along to the psychomotor one, okay? So instead of administer EpiPen, whoever that one is, might be, it might be calculate the dose or, you know, something like that might be your, 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 what you're looking at in the um, cognitive domain. So if you click, anybody who's wondering, click on the T. If, if, so if, once you get into the, the annotate kind of function, click on the T for text, and then that should allow you to put a text box on the, on the um, screen and write in it. Promote and identify every person's role in an acute stroke call. Um, so that's, a very, again, that's very useful. So you want to, but there's actually two things in that, two action verbs. You want them to promote and identify. Now, I suppose they're quite related in a way, um, but generally we would say you're better to identify one action verb per learning outcome. So interpret the chest x-ray for pleural effusion. Absolutely, that's, um, that's a, a good cognitive and a nice, and often learning, the best learning outcomes are often quite short. Recognize a deteriorating patient based on a news. Absolutely, yeah. And some of these actually, they're, they're not all wholly, um, not every learning outcome is purely one or the other. Often you'll get a bit of effective in, in some of the cognitive ones. So recognizing a deteriorating patient based on a news kind of has to do with, um, there's an effective component to that as well in that students are kind of making an, evan an evaluation or a judgment there too. Okay, so encourage. Um, I, I'm not sure where that's going to where that's going to go because encourage. You see, encourage team effort. Okay, you want a student to be able to encourage team effort. Is that what you're saying there? Okay, so the student will be able to encourage team effort. Okay, I find encourage a little bit um, vague there in terms of how are you. I suppose it is accessible. Um, it's not so much an action verb as some of the others, things like differentiate. The, the more kind of active your verb is, the easier it's going to be to assess it. I see someone in the chat there has put in interpret ECG rhythms. That's a good one. So what you're going to do then is you're going to start thinking about what the teaching and learning activity is going to be that goes with your learning outcome. So demonstrate knowledge of treatment of acute asthma. Yeah. So they're going to demonstrate it then by your teaching and learning activities. You're going to give them an opportunity to demonstrate that knowledge and practice. So what you need to do now, um, I see a number of things up there. So if you have something up there, what you might think about now is maybe underneath what you've written is, is just give a brief kind of impression of what they're going to do to um, demonstrate or to, to learn that, or how is that learning going to be brought into the, um, into the, uh, yeah, I see. So I'm seeing somebody here use the 4AT tool. Yeah, so I see somebody in the chat saying recognize and classify hyponatremia. So I'm taking it that some of you aren't managing to write things on the board, which is fine. The chat will work fine as well. Interpret ECG rhythms, recognize, absolutely. Identify red flag symptoms associated with drug rashes. Absolutely. They're all very um, good ways, um, good kind of cognitive learning outcomes. So what you're going to have to do now is and some of these might be good in one situation, but might not work in a simulation. So for example, um, if it's identify a rash, are you going to be able to provide 
students with an opportunity to identify that rash in the actual session? Um, or how are you going to do that? You need to think about can the teaching and learning activity then match what you're trying to do here, okay? Assess fluid status. So how are you going to set it up so that students can assess fluid status? Are you going to provide them with intake output sheets and blood pressure measurements? Or are they going to be able to measure a skin turgor or whatever it is? So you need to kind of think through what is what are the activities? Um, and it's not so easy to write those up now, but it's just to kind of get you thinking about it. OK, so for each one of these, you need to be able to think what teaching and learning activities will be mapped to this. And we can even move on from that now to think, OK, how would somebody judging this or how would you, looking back on the recording of the scenario or watching it live, know that a student has reached that learning outcome, that they're now able to do that? So the um, I differentiate acute stroke patients likely to benefit from thrombectomy. So what scenario, how are you going to set up the learning um, and how are you going to see that students can now as, uh, have got, have, how are you going to assess that they've achieved that learning outcome? So I'm looking at recognize, classify hyponatremia, acute versus chronic. So presumably you're going to give them blood results as part of the scenario and then how we, what's the next thing? Are you going to require them to work out, to write a prescription for fluids, say, or for medications you might give in this particular scenario? Or, you know, so they're the kind of things that would be the things that you could assess. Okay. Just going back to the encourage team efforts that I see there, that's probably more, um, now that I think of it, that's probably something that's more in the effective domain as well. It's not so much a cognitive thing, is it? Team effort is has to do with appreciation of teamwork, and it would be more something that you would be um, looking at from an effective point of view. So, okay. Maybe if we just take off the focus of writing on the board at the moment, and I might ask you if you have any particular questions. If anyone has a question, because this has probably got you thinking now a little bit. Has anyone got a question? Are you okay for us to just yep. ask away? Absolutely. Hi, Thank you very much. Hi, how are you? Uh, just a quick one about the overall design of the um, simulation scenario. Yeah. So how long should it be? OK, so I'm not going to be able to answer that for you. John um, is probably a better person to answer okay. the specifics regarding the simulation scenarios. And I know you'll be getting something more teaching about actual design of specific simulation scenarios in the coming sessions. But John might talk to you about the length of it there. Um, hi, Leanne. Um, I guess the answer to this is that it's going to be as long as it needs to be. I mean, so if you start from the basis that Catherine is laying out here, whereby you begin by setting out a set of outcomes that you wish to achieve, then map it forward towards what the learners will need to do within the scenario in order to achieve those um, then you're roughly going to have an idea of how long the scenario is going to be. So there isn't some of these scenarios, um, you know, looking through it, some people are, are attempting to teach, you know, a particularly rare but very important skill that's probably teachable within just a few minutes. And then other people are trying to stimulate what will be possibly reasonably extended consultations. And, and each of those is perfectly valid, um, provided it's clear that the duration of time is proportionate to the outcomes that have been specified at the outset. So that's why it's really, really important that this step here is right so that the rest of the scenario then goes on and makes sense. Do you, do, do, does that answer your question? That's perfect, John. Thank you so much. We just were wondering as well if um, it's a multidisciplinary kind of approach that we would have nurses and other members of staff within the scenarios. Is that something you would? Absolutely, yeah. Anticipate, so I think yeah. 
Yeah, so, you know, I suppose within the scenario, um, you can have, you can specify more than one learner. So it might be that within a scenario, there is learning to be had by both maybe an NCHD and uh, maybe a staff nurse on the ward, in which case you will introduce both of those learners into your scenario when you, when you run it. But you may also be simulating the roles played by other team members albeit that they're not necessarily member uh, learners you know so so for example if, if it's a scenario that would ordinarily involve a physiotherapist maybe a a, a social worker a staff nurse and um, an nchd you may decide that the staff nurse and the nchd are the learners in this particular situation and you get two confederates in to play the parts essentially of the other two members but they're kind of in on the the whole deal if you understand perfect thank you very much um, so yeah, so uh, so uh, yeah. Hopefully that answers that. Any other questions? Anything else at the moment? Okay. So I was going to move on to just back to the presentation for a moment, um, if that's okay, John. And we'll just talk a little bit about the psychomotor. Um, share my screen. Sorry. Share this one here. Okay, so so well done on that. Um, so the psychomotor domain, I think this one should be kind of a, an important part in terms of simulation, um, because a lot of simulation very much has to do with kind of that performance piece or to de and be demonstrating things. So if you look at the kind of verbs there, copy would be a very lower kind of level um, learning outcome in terms of the psychomotor domain. Um, and say, you know, as you move down that list, they're kind of becoming a little bit more complex. So measuring something like measuring a blood pressure would be, I mean, that's a good example, I suppose, measuring a blood pressure of that constructive alignment piece. So if, if you said at the end of this session, I'm not saying this is what your simulation session is going to be doing, but if you pick blood pressure as a measurement, or as a learning outcome, and you wrote a learning outcome at the end of this session, students will be able to measure a patient's blood pressure. Then you can from there see that the teaching and learning activity might be to give them a little bit of theory on blood pressure. What does a systolic, what does a diastolic mean? How do you, what are the steps in measuring a blood pressure? Then you'd get them to actually perform it because you want them to be doing something in the psychomotor domain as your learning outcome, you want them to actually be able to measure a blood pressure. So you need to give them an actual task to do. And then the assessment would be, uh, um, can they measure it? Can have they, do they use the right technique and do they get the right figure at the end or the, you know, the, a ballpark correct figure. So that might be your assessment in the real world or in the medical school might be in the form of an OSCE for something like that as a physical practical task. So that just gives you kind of an example of that train of thought. Um, so what I want you to do now is to think about your simulation um, and write a learning outcome in the psychomotor domain that your simulation will involve. Okay, so we might just share the whiteboard again, John, if that's okay. I'll stop sharing my screen. So at the end of the session, students will be able to. Again, you'll have to go into the view options, annotate and click that text box and you can type in then. Okay, so they're going to be able to perform something somebody has here, which is a good one because, okay, so it's seeing what they'll be able to perform. Identify wouldn't tend, it is more a cognitive learning outcome. I see constructed differential for acute wheeze. Again, that's cognitive. They're not physically, they're not performing a task. So think of the psychomotor in terms of performing a task. The construction of a differential. I know this, it can be a little hard to kind of grasp all of this in one 
um, you know, in this length of time. There's a very good resource that I'll point you to at the end of the session. And as I said, I'll share the, the lecture with you as well. Perform interosseous access insertion, perfect. Perform a primary survey, perfect. They're examples of a task, um, something physical that the student will do or that the, that the participant will do. Yeah, identify surface anatomy and landmarks. That could be um, a psychomotor in terms of, I suppose, you know, identifying as in it being a physical task in that instance. Administer an EpiPen is perfect as well. Um, good, yes, absolutely. So perform good chest compressions. Demonstrate competency in NG tube insertion. Absolutely. So, um, so what I would say there is, yeah, absolutely. No, that's good. Perform a full skin examination. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see it perform is a very useful one in this, isn't it? But as I said, it's not it's not exclusive to perform either. So that identifies surface anatomy and landmarks because it is a task and it's a physical kind of task um, that, that could be assessed in a couple of ways. But if it's psychomotor, ideally it should be assessed by, um, if you're considering it as a psychomotor learning outcome, the identify surface anatomy and landmark should actually be the task, like have the student there pointing to McBurney's point or whatever it is. Whereas if you were assessing that in a cognitive way, it would be getting them to write down um, the surface anatomy, like you, the, you know, the, where the valves of the heart are second intercostal space in the midclavicular line or whatever it is you're, um, so it could be assessed in two different ways. Identify likely drug. Um, no, that, so identify a likely causative drug, even though that in a way is a task, it's not actually, a, I, I don't see that as psychomotor because that's more a cognitive, you're more having to think to identify that drug. It's not a physical task. Think of blood pressure measurement or performing something um, in terms of thinking of a psychomotor assessment or how you're going to um, write the learning outcome. Yeah, prepare for emergency airway. That might be putting all the equipment on a tray. That would, there'd be a psychomotor element to that. There would be a cognitive element to it as well. So I'm seeing there the identified causative drug um, from a drug list in the context of a drug rash. As I said, what would be a, a psychomotor um, one there would be to, you know, check to see if a rash is purpuric or if it's blanching or, you know, th that would be more psychomotor, something that you would do with the examination, not to pick a drug off a list. That's more cognitive. Use the bladder scanner correctly. Yeah, that's a good one. Are you kind of getting what I'm saying there? Am I confusing you? So demonstrate knowledge regarding, so the very fact that you've got knowledge in there is more, that's more cognitive again, demonstrate knowledge regarding thrombolysis dose calculations. Yeah, Eleanor? So I'm from psychiatry. Yeah. And uh, so we've been looking up um, simulated scenarios on yeah. the other that other people have done. Yeah. So a lot of us will be, you know, trying to identify, um, you know, do a mental state examination, for instance. Yeah. So uh, it sounds like that's very cognitive. Yeah. So I think it it, it kind of depends on what area you're doing your simulation in. I agree. And not, and I did say at the earlier on that not every um, domain will be as relevant in every scenario. So if you're very much talking about um, simulation in terms of the kind of emergency simulation that you get in, um, you know, say 
like CPR or a deteriorating patient with a physical issue, then th that tends to have more of a psychomotor component. I think you're a different situation um, and you would be look more effective and cognitive would probably be relevant to yours. So I think you have to, I think it's hard to have a hard and fast rule. And this is a very good demonstration actually of where it might not be relevant to have a psychomotor one, unless it was a simulation around say a drug overdose. Um, where there might be the performance of, you know, administering a naloxone, say in the case of an overdose or, you know what I mean? It, 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 just thinking of that off the top of my head, but I think um, the psychomotor may not be as relevant to ye as it would be to a lot of the other people who have, um, who are putting together scenarios for this. And, and that's perfectly fine. You know, yeah. they're, they're, it's not that, every single domain must be covered. It, it can have value and still only have learning outcomes identified within maybe two of the domains, you know? Yeah. Um, so it, it's not necessary that every single domain is covered out by the scenario. So I would say you, you should always try and get a second domain in, um, the third if possible, but it's not always relevant. And the one that's often left out in the more um, typical simulation scenarios like would be the effective one. People tend to forget that one quite often. Um, the things like, and, and there can be some very practical ones in terms of the effective domain. We'll come to that in a moment. I'm not sure of the time. Actually, in, in the interest of time, we may not get through the full effective one. But things like hand washing, um, proper hand hygiene, it would be an effective, could be an eff a, measure, a measure of the effective domain in some instances. Uh, people take on board the fact that hand hygiene um, that you know proper donning and doffing those kind of things can be considered effective as well anybody eleanor does that kind of address yeah you? yeah i I'm, I'm afraid i entered late so i'm i'm afraid to ask too many questions in case they've already been covered but anyway um thank you no problem um i'll share the presentation afterwards eleanor anyway and um as I said, there's a very good resource, a book, book, a little booklet I'll refer you to that's free download as well. Um, Orla Kelly has pointed out in the chat section, Catherine, that, you know, it can be challenging to bring in psychomotor learning outcomes for SIM when we're using limited fidelity mannequins. Yeah. Um, from an ED perspective, it will be yeah. difficult to practice chest drains, IO insertions, etc. Um, I mean, uh, or maybe I might offer some um, answers to that. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think we necessarily would say that there can't be any skills trainers um, already within the scenarios there are a number of people who are planning on sort of creating a skills trainer of sorts and um, to display a particular technique we have specified that you can't use a skills trainer that would not be generally available. I mean, one of the, the challenges, I think, within the competition and for the deployment of simulation across the group at the moment is that uh, these trainers are not widely available right now. So ideally, we want people to focus on delivering learning without necessarily having to rely on, on, on high fidelity trainers. I think uh, as the years go by, um, we're going to see more and more opportunities within this competition and and, and uh, in general to use higher fidelity um, skills trainers all of the time. But for now, I think we need to try and keep it um, to a stage that it'll be accessible to everybody. Okay, so um, anybody else got any questions just at the moment? Okay, so what I might just do is go back to the presentation and um, sorry now just get back into it and kind of wrap up at this point okay so um, I'm probably we probably won't have time to to do the effective domain I'm not sure I'd say a lot of you are probably heading back to from a work perspective, but just in terms of the effective domain, um, I mean, you can come in in multiple ways. So for example, you might recognize professional behavior within a scenario through, for example, as I mentioned, hand hygiene, um, that, that listening and responding to patients or to other members of your team, um, through being aware of what's going on, 
through um, good communication skills. Um, it might be by professional behavior in terms of kind of hand hygiene um, and guidelines, donning and doffing, whatever. Um, other areas that, you know, not necessarily in simulation, but where you can, if, uh, other ways you can test or assess effective, the effective domain would be to get somebody to argue the point for something, to argue an approach for something, or to evaluate or judge um, an approach to something. So I'm not going to, as I said, I won't dwell on that. I just wanted to get to this slide just to show you how you might, um, it's, it's just a very practical kind of slide in terms of how you might map out in your own head, even if you don't write it this way on the application form, how you might map out um, your learning outcome, align, aligning with your le learning activity, aligning with assessment. So for example, at the beginning, I said one of the learning outcomes of this session was that at the end of it, students or participants would be able to construct learning outcomes in the cognitive, psychomotor and effective domains. So it, the learning activity around that that we did was, I gave you a little bit of a theoretical aspect, um, uh, the theoretical background to learning outcomes, to the different types of learning outcomes, to the different levels and how you might approach writing them. Um, and then there was a practical element that you constructed, you, you did actually construct learning outcomes. Um, and then the, sorry, the review of that might be, in terms of assessment, then you'd be reviewing the constructed learning outcomes and seeing if they were appropriate or not. Um, how, you know, did they need a bit of tweaking here or there? So that's the kind of, that kind of gives you an idea of the sort of format. So in terms of assessment, you're probably not going to be assessing students necessarily within your simulation, but the people who are looking at your simulation and um, judging it will be looking at this to see if you're submitting a recording they'll be looking for evidence that you address the learning outcomes and that students were able to do something at the end or were not maybe but that you tried to get them to that point. I am um, Catherine if it was okay I might just start to highlight to people that this slide very kind of fundamentally lays out the way in which we intend to assess the uh, the, the, the scenarios and um, I, I think we'd be looking at how clearly and focused the uh, learning outcomes have been um, laid out, then whether or not the proposed scenario and the supporting resources, et cetera, clearly address the outcomes that have been um, put in place. And there will be a session that will be running, I think it's the very final session, whereby we'll actually go through how you might actually be able to assess whether or not your learners actually achieved what you had hoped they might. Um, and, and it's going to be all of those things that are going to finally decide um, which of the scenarios um, will um, will go through the final <laughs> kind of thing. So, so it is an important um, um, it is an important slide just to, to to remember. So, I'm going to send this on the presentation on to John afterwards, and he can um, share it with you. Um, that's just the resource that I was talking about. There, there are links to it. There's, there's a useful article there, and then there's the publication. Um, it comes in a little A5 booklet, a hard copy, but you can actually download it. Um, I think it's this second one here, the CORA UCC one. It's actually the, I think it's the most widely downloaded document from UCC. It's it's really, really high, very good. Um, Declan Kendi in UCC is kind of an expert in this area. Um, and this is a booklet that he produced a number of years ago, but the principles have remained unchanged. Um, and it's really handy. It's very practically focused. And there's some very good information in it. So just to check, have anyone got any questions at this point? No, I think we've, we've okay. probably, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for your participation. Um, that was actually great to see so many of you contributing to the whiteboards. It's the first time I've tried using it on Zoom and it works reasonably well, I think. So, so thank you for that. And thank you, Catherine. Best of luck. Yeah, so no, sincerely, thank you very much. I, I hope people um, got what they needed from that. Um, I, I, I do think it is really important that you are very clear on what it is that you intend to achieve before you move on to the rest of your design. Um, and again, I think to emphasize what Catherine highlighted towards the very beginning of this, I mean, I suppose if there was any feedback to some of the scenarios, it may be that the ambition 
at the moment is very, very high and that maybe refining it down to a smaller number of learning outcomes might be a, uh, might be a good idea. Um, it'll make the thing a little bit easier to deliver. Um, if that's it, um, I think we have the next session on Friday at lunchtime. Um, the same link should um, work for the, the session on Friday. So that's Dave Power. He's going to do the first of the scenario design um, sessions. So hopefully that'll be enjoyable. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.